Um, my name is Josh. I'm currently a research assistant at the University of Cambridge, and my broad research interests are in tropical ecology. Um, previous to my current role, I studied for a BA in biological sciences at the University of Oxford and an MRes in tropical forest ecology at Imperial College London. Unsurprising, I'm also a first gen student, and I spent a fair amount of time talking about this through various BES channels. But the problem is that I alone can't represent the full spectrum of first generation experiences. Although I went to a state school in Wales, I'm also white, lower middle class, and a man. This panel is therefore an attempt to kind of broaden the range of experiences and advice on offer for first-gen ecologists, and is why we have our panelists here tonight. So in no particular order, we have Roberto Salguero Gomez, um, sorry if I butchered that pronunciation, Rob, um, who is originally from Spain and is now an associate professor at the University of Oxford. He researches animal and plant demographics. We also have Raheem Dina, a Seychellian ecologist who has previously completed BSc at Sheffield Hallam University and is currently undertaking a PhD at Imperial College London on the structure of plant communities. Magda Grabowski, a Polish American postdoc at the University of Wyoming, uh, who studies the causes and consequences of plant invasions in Wyoming and Californian grasslands. Uh, Rachel Hester, who undertook her undergraduate degree at Trinity College Dublin and is now looking at the invasion ecology of alpine newts for a PhD at University College London. Bruno Gersi, a Peruvian veterinary scientist who works at a post, as a postdoc at Tufts University, examining the spillover of zoonotic diseases in humans. And last but not least, we have April Burt, who's just finished her DPhil at the University of Oxford focusing on island ecosystem management, and will soon be starting a job at the Seychelles Island Foundation and the Eden Project. So to start off, I think our first question will basically be, why do you guys think it's important to discuss being a first gen student in ecology in the first place? Basically, why are we all here? Why, why is this event important? Um, anyone have any initial thoughts? Um, from my perspective, Josh, I had never heard of the term when I was at university and actually never really heard of it until I got to Oxford to do my DPhil. And so I think it's partly bringing some understanding to the term of what first gen means, um, but what it really means, not just that you're the first person to go to university in your family, um, but it's a fair assumption to make that people's whose parents didn't go to university are probably more likely to come from low income backgrounds and all the implications that go with that. So for me, it's about defining uh, what it means to be a first gen student. Okay, anyone else from the panel? I guess for me, it would, I think it would be important to, to kind of raise awareness about like not only for other potential first generation students, but also for academics and for other students who are second generation, third generation, um, just to kind of let them know that there's not one kind of size fits all student that attends university. And that there are a diverse group of students um, and you do have to cater to a lot of different backgrounds, um, especially as an academic, you know, you might, you might have assumptions that students know how to reference after two weeks whereas like I know some first generation students like myself would have been like I have to reference every single sentence like what is this and I have no one to ask about it at home so yeah just to kind of raise awareness um for for academics and other peers in college and university I guess for me also uh like agreeing with everyone else but uh i i think it is kind of first gen also kind of comes with a lot of other groups like i feel like often first generation students tend to be from like minority backgrounds or working class so it's kind of a good way to show that people from these sorts of backgrounds are also attending university and like the sort of hoops and we have to like go through to figure out the system, I guess. One thing I'd like to add is that um, a lot of the 
experiences that people often need to get jobs in ecology or to pursue degrees post um, university or post bachelors in the US really hinge on getting experiences early. So having exposure to lab work or research opportunities or field work early on, I think is quite important. And I had no idea that this was even a possibility through my first four years of undergraduate. Um, and so I was working other jobs, not knowing that I could get paid to work in a lab or to be a field assistant during um, a summer season, as opposed to working at a restaurant. And so just having that um, awareness of, you know, first generation students might need a little bit more outreach to let them know about the opportunities that are available, I think can help set folks on a really positive trajectory if this is something they want to pursue long term. Bruno or Rob, I think you guys, one of you guys are next. So I lost the connection for a second. I had to switch my computer. So I apologize. I couldn't quite hear the, 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 what the okay. question was. Um, so why do you think it's important to discuss being a first gen student in, in ecology in the first place? So again, I'm, I feel like I'm about to repeat things that have been said. I apologize for repeating myself uh, on things that my excellent uh, course because might have mentioned before. I think it's, it's, it's really important to add diversity we are all striving to bring more diversity and it's really important to also perhaps plays become become a bit of that role model that most of us didn't have right and i'm i'm trying now to uh within the limits of time given my, my basic profession all of our basic professions make the the, the the mental space to send the elevator down i think that's really important right just because um you've got into a certain rank doesn't mean that you, you must forget about how difficult it was to get there and, and perhaps serve as a vessel to showcase to other people with your background or different backgrounds that um it's possible and that it's really important to get to know shortcuts and ways in which academia for instance in my case works which is quite a strange world i have to admit i still don't think i fully understand it yeah i have to agree with rob and definitely there's a lot of back doors that you need to know that exist or that are available for you uh, definitely having to, i've been talking with college students lately and talking about ecology and career path and definitely that what magda was mentioning about having the opportunity to work in a lab for the summer and getting gaining experience while you are in college uh, it's something that many of them either don't know exists or they don't have the opportunity. Sometimes there will be volunteer positions, but they do have to work and get a salary and pay rent. So those options have to be measured as well. And we need to adapt to that and try to accommodate. So, so sort of building on that, do you think in ecology in particular, are any challenges that first gen students face that they wouldn't if they went to say another field like maybe physics or something more professional like law or uh, politics or something like that? Is there anything specific to ecology that makes it really fundamental that we're addressing these questions first and foremost, rather than kind of following examples set in other fields? Um, I say from my experience uh i've since i guess lockdown i've managed to i've made more friends online who are doing phds in other fields and a lot of them uh like physics and engineering they i feel like they seem more diverse to me like in terms of background <laughs> and i think this might just be because a lot of those fields have more money to take in more people and then the issue is if there's a limited number of spaces in ecology for like PhDs, if they just purely say like who has this experience, this masters and so on, you're going to end up picking people who have a more like privileged, smaller set of backgrounds. And I, yeah, like I, I remember when I first, because my undergrad was mostly more kind of human side biology. And then once I started interacting with more people in botany and ecology, I didn't realize that there was like I, I hadn't really met anyone from like private education before I 
got into this field and then I realized how common it was and people who had backgrounds in this and their parents and I guess there's things that they knew that helped them more like getting especially like practical experience I think that's a, a big thing that I didn't even know you could do yeah I would agree with that I think especially in ecology you're supposed to build up this experience of field work um, and I remember being at uni and a lot of um, my peers would go off every summer and do um, like dolphin counting or you know tropical field work or something like that and um, these things that you had to pay for um, so it wasn't really accessible to everyone it wasn't a you know even playing field as it were um, I think also maybe first gen students are less likely to have family connections that they can draw on from the field ecology um, and also maybe just you're you're less exposed to the natural world outside of the place where you come from um, so that's another maybe a setback for um, first gen students in ecology yeah i would if i may i would agree with that april on on, on the last point about um, connections to the locations I'm, I'm not saying that all of ecology works on on remote field work but a lot of ecologists do carry out a certain degree of field work and sometimes that takes you to different locations oftentimes that takes you overseas and away from the place where you've you've been born and, and raised um and so that brings about a whole new set of challenges that have to do with speaking a different language or even if you're going to a region that has got the same language um cultural shock right and if you don't have anybody in your family that has gone through something like that then um, you're you're pretty much by yourself uh, i think something that i really struggled with as a first generation ecologist especially early on in my undergraduate was i had this misconception that when i went to to university and I picked a course it would have to get me a job straight away and it would have to get me a really stable job I just had this notion in my head because the only kind of things I was exposed to to do with university were like on television and films and stuff and I was like I'm gonna have to graduate I actually didn't even know that PhDs were a thing and that postdocs were a thing I had no idea that I could go on to do that I just thought I'm gonna do ecology and I'm gonna get a job and then of course there's this old kind of thing of zoologists and ecologists don't get jobs especially not in Ireland and um, so I did have a lot of people in my ear saying that at the start so I found that kind of kind of hard to deal with and then as I kind of spoke to mentors and other other people that I met and um, other PhD students and stuff, I actually found out that you, you can stay in research and you don't have to get this nine to five job that I thought I had to get at the start of, uh, of college. So yeah, that's, that's probably something I struggled with a little bit. One thing I would like to add too is I think there are a lot of barriers with just the culture of ecology, which might not always be the most inclusive culture. So talking about things like field work, um, you know, if people don't grow up going outside, this seems like often a frightening field to go into or like, why on earth would you go count plants all day, every day? But there's also financial barriers that aren't included in grants, that aren't included as PIs, you know, are taking on new students of field clothes and boots and, you know, just all of the extra stuff um, that goes along with sort of learning how to take field work, if that is part of your um, ecology uh, research or back, you know, what you need to be doing. And I just think that's something that people don't talk about very often, but um, I know plenty of people who are like, what kind of shoes do I wear? You know, what kind of pants do I wear for the field? And often it depends on like, are you working with cacti or are you working in a tropical area? And this isn't really like common knowledge. Um, even if people do get to go outside growing up, you know, if you're changing systems, it's a whole extra layer of complexity. So I think there's kind of two questions that link into that. So I think the first one is this idea of like not being able to get experience um, or, find, or not knowing where to get experience from. And I know a lot of the opportunities in ecology that are kind of very present as an undergrad are the paid for volunteer experiences, stuff like Operation Wallacea, 
um, which is something I did, but I only was able to afford it after I took a year out of uni where I worked. And then I used all that money to do the Art Pole expedition. But if people don't take a year out of uni or they don't have a job or something like that, what are the alternatives, the sort of, what are things that you guys think ecologists could do for free um, and how should first gen ecologists go about finding that experience? Well, I, my experience has been completely different as I did my veterinary degree in Peru and you go straight from college, I guess, to, to that uh, program. But talking here and seeing with people, uh, sometimes they don't know that they can reach to their professors and they will have some local projects that they're, they have going on the background that won't require much travel or much time dedication that they can do once a week or so on. Uh, again, it's, it's a barrier that sometimes you have to rush from classes to work and that will be a problem, but uh, many, op many professors will have or many universities have options for funding for the summer and they can write small grants and that will get them going. But again, you need to know that those exist and have a professor and a lab you're planning to work with ahead of time. Uh, those are kind of options that I think sometimes are not seen or known about for everybody. I yeah. think, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you, you go, you go. I was just gonna say, I think that um, this part of this responsibility falls on to PIs or lab heads or higher up people in ecology to first of all, reach out to students and let them know opportunities are available. Like I think that unpaid field work <laughs> is really a huge barrier to trying to get the experience that people want for professions in ecology or graduate work. So I hope, that people start, you know, like higher up folks in the field really start to acknowledge that that is a huge barrier to participation. And then um, I always, once I knew that I could apply for money as a student, I started to contact prof and like knew that this was an option. I started to contact professors and say like, hey, I have this idea, it might not be great. But um, once that dialogue is started, I think that professors are often willing to help students, right? Um, grant proposals or apply for fellowships. And that was really um, kind of a turning point for me being like, you know, I can take this into my own hands and try to get my own funding to do something. Um, but I do think that, you know, awareness of those opportunities is a huge part of that. And I think that should fall on the PIs. Yeah, and I think also we've talked about um, volunteering abroad programs and things like that, but, um, you know, there's a lot of things you don't have to travel far to volunteer for. Um, so I remember when I was really looking for jobs and couldn't find a, anything, I was working um, night shifts, but also then in the day I was volunteering for the National Marine Aquarium in Plymouth, which just by doing that got me the next thing along. Um, but of course it does depend on your time, commitments and other things, whether you, you're able to do those kind of local volunteering as well on top of your work. I think, uh, just Tyreen, do you no, want to sorry, go? No, uh, no, you can go. Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, no, just leading on from April's point, I guess, about not really having time to volunteer. I, I probably would have been in a position where I didn't um, have time to volunteer. And I think recently I've been speaking with people in my lab and stuff about the power of citizen science and about just getting out on a walk and using apps like iNaturalist to contribute data to, to projects. So just getting in touch with, with researchers that have active on the ground citizen science, citizen science projects and like the, just the power of being able to collect data down the road when you're going on a walk and um you don't even know what you're contributing to and it doesn't have to be flying out to Costa Rica and spending three weeks in the jungle I know I would have loved that as well and I would have thought when I was an undergrad that that was like the pinnacle of research that you have to be doing to get PhD positions but sometimes it really is more local and um less 
extravagant than having to hop on a plane and go out like you can literally do it in the palm of your hand and that's just as good as going on a, a paid to volunteer position I think. Uh, I personally I did a placement year which I guess depending on your situation might might not be the best thing but uh so like for me my placement year was unpaid but because it was during my degree I was funded through my student loan and because of uh, it being like in the public sector I didn't have to pay tuition fees to do that year but then as I was there and I think it became because it was quite like a contentious thing that there were students not being paid as I was there they introduced paying students for the un upcoming years and uh, there was also people that came to do summer or like smaller projects for like a month or two uh, which were able to get paid and that's what I ended up doing is that I I left my own placement and reapplied to the same placement that was paid so I could actually get paid to do it uh, yeah I, I remember also when I was doing my my undergraduate, um, so did my undergraduate back in Spain in a small university called Universidad de Cádiz. It's in the very south of the Iberian Peninsula. It's the southernmost tip of Europe, by the way. Um, so it's lovely from a weather and a food perspective. It's it's quite not so lovely from an economics perspective. Three and four of my friends who went on to get their bachelors are now um, unemployed. So that's quite sad. But anyways, I was in my undergraduate and, and I was really hungry for, you know, becoming engaged within the research as soon as I possibly could. And, and I didn't know that you could, like many of you have mentioned, right? you could actually just walk into a PI's lab and, and say, hey, have you got something, right? Back in that time, of course, I'm a lot older than many of you guys in the, in the panel, um, doing free work was, it was just the norm. And um, that's something that I'm really happy to see in the discipline that we actually no longer, I'd like to, to think of it was that we no longer accept that as valid. Um, I don't know what Universidad de Cat is doing these days, but I, I'm, I'm really proud to say that Oxford does not allow to take any uh, undergraduate, any, any, uh, any volunteer really, unless the PIs are able to provide for them or we actively work with them to, as Magda mentioned before, write proposals. So that's, that's the current status in which we are. But I do remember that as I was doing my undergraduate back in Spain, I, I did do the, the typical thing that Rahim has mentioned, you know, you volunteer and April as well. And then, and then you become a, an RA, free labor RA. I don't, you know, it's a tricky one. And that's where one of the main disadvantages are for, for uh, folks with uh, disadvantage, uh, disadvantage background, perhaps first gen as well. It's not fair. Is it so to, to those who are in that situation? I think that one thing that goes a long way is proactivity. I'm always telling my students that the mountain rarely comes to Muhammad, that instead, Muhammad must walk to the mountain. They are Muhammad, the mountain is the opportunity. So, I think that writing an email, not a general email, but a very well tailored email to a specific person that you want to work with briefly explaining what your situation and your interests are and why you want to work with that person and explaining perhaps a bit more if you feel comfortable about your your socioeconomic background perhaps your degree of first second third gen and what it is that you need to be able to get activated within research having an earnest conversation can go a long way so i have found myself it's been through conversations like that that i've managed to secure opportunity after opportunity. The first opportunity was quite small, doing an internship for like a few weeks and it was paid. And after that, that they get, that they get into like, you know, access to a master's program and then a PhD in the US and then going to, it, it just gets you that proactivity can really get you a long ways. But it can be difficult because you don't even know what that email should look like, right? Um, so obviously I'm, you know, I'm on the panels, I'm sure that everybody will agree, but I'm very happy if any of you who are listening to, to this, uh, if you want some advice on what that email should look like, if you want to approach an academic, I'm very happy to, to give you some feedback if you approach me. Um, I can tell you what a, a bad email would look like. Dear Professor Coma, um, I would like to work in your team. And then giving me a really long answer that due to academic pressures, we will not have the time to do justice to, to read in a great level of detail. 
and then not even attaching your CV or telling me why it is that you want to work in my team. Um, that dear professor coma already is perhaps shouldn't be, but it's a big deterrent because it tells me that you really haven't done your homework. You haven't really explained either to yourself and or to me why it is that you want to work with me. If you're not able to say Rob, for instance, in my case, right? So I think that making sure that you write perhaps a skeleton of an email that you can tailor to the specific X many TIs that you want to approach and then tailor it further to each specific individual, calling them by name and changing the narrative. I want to work with you because my passion is in tropical forest ecologies and you're one of the leaders in that. And I read your paper that you published last year. And I think that I would be really keen to learn what you're doing. These are my ideas like Mag that was mentioned before, right? The ideas might not be good or so you think by the way, because most times the ideas are great. Um, but that, that honest and very specific dialogue can really get you very far, I would say. So I think another thing that kind of came out of the question previous was this idea of going into ecology and not knowing much outside of your local area, or maybe not knowing much about ecology in general. So I just wanted to know whether when the panel started out in ecology, did you feel that you had less knowledge um, about ecology compared to non-first gen peers? And if so, do you have any advice on how you overcame this particular, like, particular form of imposter syndrome? Um, I guess I can start there. I think I definitely, when I, because I think I did my undergraduate and I was a first gen, but I was also, um, for me, the most recent experience has been doing my PhD. And I it undoubtedly had a different level of knowledge going into my PhD than my peers. Firstly, because I didn't do A-levels in science. And secondly, because I didn't do a master's. So I knew that there was a big difference between um, the people that I was working alongside. Um, but I think one of the things I've learned through this experience is that it's often not those academic um, skills that are gonna get you through these experiences. And actually sometimes um, the challenges that I faced in getting to Oxford to do my PhD have actually been helpful because um, I've been better able to cope with the situation or so as it is I've just finished and um, it was challenging but I, I think it wasn't more challenging for me than it was for my peers because they had a better academic background than I did um, so that's my take-home message. like to follow up on that with what April said one thing I think is really important is to not sell like even if you don't have research experience a lot of first generation students have a lot of work experience and I got my first field job not because I had research experience because I had worked with little kids in a field camp and taught them how to go skiing and my boss recognized like if you can wrangle 10 children in the outdoors, you can be, you can handle what I have laid out for you in the field this summer. And so I think that, you know, not selling those experiences short, and especially early on sort of capitalizing on those and talking about the skills you've gained elsewhere is really important because often working on teams, like adapting to changing situations in the field, being able to deal with lack of resources, like all of that actually ends up being really important in science and it took someone else acknowledging that for me to realize that but I think it's important especially early on to say like no I don't have an experience in you know chasing bats in Panama but I do have x y and z and this is how I can apply this to what you're asking me to do and I think that the most important thing is often like learning being adaptable and like being a good team player and that often comes from experiences that are not research-based ecology field experiences for a lot of people. So I think especially early on acknowledging those and telling someone, you know, I can learn this is a really great way to get your foot in the door or to get that first experience. 
Uh, just to touch on something actually, Magda, that you alluded to earlier about not having the right equipment to go out into the field and not having the right attire or anything. One of the first times I experienced ecology specific imposter syndrome was my first field trip um, in my undergraduate degree. And I showed up really excited, didn't really know what to bring because I wasn't brought on hikes with my family and I wasn't really used to being out doing all these things. I mean, we went to Spain for a week if we were lucky and stayed in a hotel and I played in the pool. I didn't really have other kinds of holidays. And I had Doc Martens. And in my innocent little first year head, I thought that Doc Martens are a perfectly suitable boot to wear to go to go out walk and they're durable, that's what they're made for. And I just got laughed at. And it was like innocent laughter from people in my class. But I remember just feeling like the biggest idiot ever. And I was like, oh, my God, like, look at all them and their hiking boots. And they've got steel cap toes. And I've got Doc Martens. And I just felt so silly for the rest of the field trip. And then that kind of perpetuated when people brought out their bird binoculars that were passed down from their granddad and their their guides. And all, all these things that I just didn't know I have to bring not their fault it's not my fault either though it's just kind of I think a simple handing out a sheet with ideal uh, field equipment would have gone and that's why I kind of said earlier about academics being aware that there are but it went a long way um for me but yeah next year I was I was fine <laughs> Yeah, definitely dress code or what to wear is a big issue. I've had similar experience going on, thick jeans to the middle of the Amazon jungle, and then sweating my the hell like it, and then I'm cutting them out because they were not useful. I've also got with very thin layer close to the Smoky Mountain or, uh, yeah, uh, most kind of blood is in this place, I don't know. It's the highlands in the, it's highland forest and it's beautiful in the day. It's 24, 30 degrees in the day, but it drops to zero at night. And I was with a summer tent for the beach. So breathing every night I was there. Uh, yeah, you can just ask people what is best to bring before doing that. As I mentioned, my I did my veterinary degree and I took basic biology classes on virology, microbiology, but nothing specific to ecology. And later on my career, I decided to get into this, was got interested in disease ecology and came to the States to do my PhD. And definitely felt weird from day one when I was sharing classroom with 21 year olds as a 32 year old student. So age was felt like a barrier at that first time. Uh, my programs and the programs in South America don't have much of a writing of essays part and component. So when I realized that everything was write this paper, write this paper, write this paper, like, first of all, not my language. So I have to figure all these things out. Uh, it was overwhelming and I, did get to points where I was like, what am I doing? I had a good job in Peru. Should I just go back and try to get it back? But talking with friends, talking with other advisors was able to push through and yeah, keep going. But it is hard and it is challenging, but just knowing that you can do it as Magda was saying, it, even if you don't have the experience, just having a good shoulder on it and saying like, I don't know how to do this, but I'm happy to learn. I'll learn it. Just show me twice and I'll be able to do it by myself. And that is enough. I started, I didn't know how to do rodent work. I didn't know how to do bat work. And two weeks later, I was leading the, the field teams to do the bat and rodent work in Peru and then in other countries. To me, um, 
when when I when I went to the US to do my my PhD and and um, again I have to contextualize again coming from a small university that not that many a couple of years ago I can you turn twenty eight years old so it's much like thirty years old it's a really small university back in Spain right going to the US for me it was like you know I'm gonna go work with this great academic and a really big university of a certain renown and and then I I start to interact with the my my fellow students in my in my same cohort, all of whom spoke perfect English. I didn't. Um, and I just feel so inadequate and I feel like such an imposter. And you know, I could communicate quite well in, in Spanish, obviously, my first language, my first tone. But um, in English, it was a whole different animal. I had to not only you know brush up on the grammar and things like that, but learn a second English, which is academic English. I think that maybe that resonates with what Bruno was saying before. And that sense of um, inadequacy was just hunting. It definitely hunted me for the first two years, that sense of I do not belong here. What am I doing here? Somebody, somebody made a mistake and I just have to make sure that they don't realize. But what was, what was interesting was towards the end of my PhD, as you probably know, PhDs in the US are much longer than typically than, than in the UK. So fifth year, um, having a conversation with, uh, the cohort, you know, my, my, my friends in my, in my same cohort, and, and for some reason or not the other, everybody, whether first gen or not, whether US native or not, they all had something to be insecure about, some imposter syndrome. I, to the younglings in this, in this uh, conversation, I have to say that uh, I don't think the imposter syndrome goes away. I certainly still have it. It's just that Oxford hasn't quite realized what they let in. Um, so I think that you just learn to live with it as a first gen or as a non-first gen. And I sometimes feel empowered with that thought that we all feel inadequate oftentimes. And that perhaps to look at it from a half full glass perspective, right? So there's room for improvements and we're also all learning together. I feel like that really makes me feel like I fit in better because I you know when I when you speak with people who won't admit to you openly that they also have got an imposter syndrome they will if you take them out for a drink I know I've already spoken but one thing that really really makes me feel better with imposter syndrome at least for a short amount of time is putting it back on the person who hired me I'm like you know what they think I'm able to do this job so I should feel like I'm, you know, they saw the other candidates and somehow, whether we fooled them or not, they trust us to do this work. And so I kind of just put my trust in them. I'm like, brilliant scientist hired me to do this. I guess I'll do it. And I just, it's, it's really helped me feel better um, to be like someone else trusts and believes in me. So I should believe in me too. And that's been really helpful at every step along the way. Like, my advisor trusted me to do a PhD. It somehow happened. They were right. I was wrong, you know? So deflecting it onto someone else has been really helpful for me. Um, to kind of go back to, yeah, what Magda said previously, uh, like I remember my placement was probably the first like ecology-esque thing I did. And I mine was entirely computational. So I guess I didn't have field work, but uh, I hadn't, I didn't have any background in coding or anything like that at the time. And I remember I kind of scared myself by, I, I still do this now. If I apply for something, I will go on Twitter and search who else has applied like in the past and see all the people and like look up their backgrounds. And I'll be like, oh, this is really scary. Like I'll see that like everyone else that's applied to this thing has like somehow, even though it's like a, in their first year of uni, already has experience from before that. And I was kind of like, oh no, how am I gonna get this? And then when I did my interview, I remember my supervisor at the time said how, because uh, my job was kind of like looking at data, she was like, a lot of this might be quite tedious and repeating. And then I mentioned how basically I spent the year before I went to uni working in an Amazon factory. And I was like, nothing, surely it can't be that tedious and long compared to that and then later on she told me that that's one of the reasons that she they hired me was because they I, I was one of the only people that actually applied that had like a work experience that was 
like in the non-academic world and had been through like that sort of job and it wasn't just kind of in a kind of ecology research background if that makes sense so i think there is always a way to turn any sort of opportunity you've had in the past into a way of being relevant that's actually a really interesting example there of um like sort of what you're talking about turning kind of the non-academic things into an academic skill um so another thing i just want to kind of briefly ask about what you all kind of alluded to as well was kind of the idea of networking as an ecologist and obviously when you get to university networking it's this really big thing everyone talks about networking people come in with linkedin profiles and all this bizarre thing which you're never really taught to do or it's not really emphasized if you went to a state school or a comprehensive school or if your parents just got a job in the town that they grew up in um so how do you think sort of building on the previous answers we should network as first gen ecologists how do you kind of adapt and kind of make net networking more comfortable more a sort of first gen style thing rather than something that you feel more uncomfortable doing it um yeah networking is always given out as career advice um almost everywhere I've been where they're giving out career advice and I take issue with it um, because um, I'm a first gen student but because there are many other reasons um, that networking is kind of excluding a whole group of people many groups of different types of people um, and putting them at a disadvantage um, specifically less confident people um, introverts and neuro neurodiverse people um, there's a whole bunch of people that hate networking and the idea of putting yourself out there and it's often the only option um, when you're given career advice and I think people need to come up with some other options um, to start telling students of ways to um, make it in the field. Yeah I think networking becomes a lot easier when you actually take the term away so labeling it as networking kind of creates this pressure where you're like sounds so formal and so terrifying and I have to go and interact with people over wine and cheese and stuff but I think what's helped for me is just breaking it down and just you know going back to the fact that it is just a conversation and just whether that's having a conversation with one academic whose research you like dropping someone an email, following someone on Twitter, um, messaging them on Twitter, like it is all networking. It doesn't have to be this, you know, perceived um, kind of interaction where you're with somebody in a suit at an event and you both holding a glass of red wine. Like it doesn't have to be like that every, every kind of little interaction you have with someone in the field. I mean, this is networking right now. And I bet a lot of people wouldn't have thought that it was networking. So yeah, I think just kind of stripping back the definition of network and has helped me a lot. Um, and then giving myself a pat on the back when I actually have been able to have a conversation with someone and come away and say, well, I can't wait to talk to them again. I can't believe I networked. <laughs> yeah, I have to kind of agree with the sort of, I say like passive networking. Uh, like there's someone I met uh, I did a kind of summer school and there was a PhD student that was, I, th I think actually was in Rob's lab at the time who uh, was like mentoring us and I met them a few days and then it happened. I mean, this is a lot of luck, I guess, that they happened to live in Sheffield when I was went back to undergrad and I happened to like uh, meet them at the pub I mean, I didn't like, it wasn't even like I was like interacting with them like at an event. I think I just kind of, and then because of that, I decided to follow them on Twitter and I would see like events advertised because I was at Sheffield Hallam, but it was at Sheffield University that were advertised just like publicly. And sometimes I'd just go to there and often I wouldn't really, I wasn't like super outgoing. I'd just kind of just go and watch the event, but that I'd see, I'd like learn a lot of things about like what people are doing and just kind of make building up this web of people that I know that even I've like not spoken to them 
I, I'm aware of them and like I'll follow them on social media. And like even the PhD that I'm doing now, I actually just found it on, even though it was at the university I'm currently at, I, I only found it on Twitter, uh, not like advertised anywhere else. So yeah, I think just social media is quite useful for that. Yeah, I agree a little bit with both. And I think with all of you guys, uh, for me, I would probably the two, three first conference I went, I would go give my talk and then sit at the back and talk to nobody because I didn't know anybody. Uh, sometimes I will talk with some professor not knowing their names and I'm very bad at names and then finding out that, oh, that's the person that wrote these five papers I was reading last week. And be like, oops, I should have talked different than I did that day or been had less drinks than I had that day. But it is still a connection. It's still a node on that network we're building. It starts with your college professors, your PhD advisors and other professors that you will have. Uh, as a vet student, my one of my professors uh, was got interested in the work I was doing for my dissertation as a veterinarian. And he's the one that then came with the results and showed them to a, another researcher. And they got interested in the work and they're like, oh, now we, we want to fund your project to keep, for you to keep it going. I didn't do anything. I didn't talk with anybody else. They saw the value of it and they push it through. Uh, at conference, sometimes I would just latch to a professor or a friend that I know it's better at talking to people than I am. And I would just be like, hey, nice to meet you whenever they meet somebody else. And just stay there, sometimes comment if there's anything I feel like I can comment or just stay present. But also our work is what promotes us. If What I think many times is if you're doing good work, doesn't matter the level. If your advisors are seeing the value of it and your professors or whoever you're working with, they'll help you push it through and they'll, whenever an, an opportunity comes, they'll be the first ones to be like, you know what, I have somebody that does good job, adapts to any situation and that can do whatever, what you need them to do. I've had many conditions or positions where I saw a an opening position or a job, and I would just be stuck before reaching out to the person promoting that, that or looking to hire somebody, I, I'll reach to contacts that I know we have in common. And many times they will be like, you know what, just send me your CV, I'll send it on the back door. And they will be like, hey, I have this person, you should interview him. I, I get that if you don't talk with people, you won't be able to you don't get that that help, that support. But it's not just because I talk to them, it's because they know the kind of work I do and how I am on my work. They wouldn't send your CV if they didn't know that you're doing good jobs because they don't want to then deal with their friend coming and being like, hey, you remember that student they, you sent me? Yeah, he was an ass. He didn't do it. He didn't work right. So it goes both ways, I think, but I agree that it's, not easy it's hard it's hard when it's in a different language it's hard when it's a different environment uh public health meetings most of the people would be kind of on suits so you had to dress up to go to these events and meetings uh wildlife disease groups people would be presenting in shorts and flip-flops that each group has their own tweaks on how they do things and you just need to be, be comfortable at adapting. And as Rahid was saying, you could follow them on Twitter, just comment on their stuff, retweet some things, maybe write them a message internally and be like, hey, I like what you did here. Build that rapport with them and, and move from there. Just quickly, very quickly add one thing that's been helpful for me is having an excuse to talk to people. So every conference has a planning committee. Every conference has a program committee. 
as students, they often want um, student perspectives or someone to organize student awards. And I love, you know, if I don't know a researcher really well, or if I know their name, but I don't know their work, this gives me an excuse to talk to them, say, are you willing to judge a poster? Are you willing to judge some talks? And then you don't even put all the pressure on yourself to talk about their brilliant science. You're just connecting as a person. And then later, when you read their papers, you could say, you know, we met for a few minutes and you already have that opening. So I would highly recommend, you know, especially at conferences, getting on that program committee or getting, um, you know, volunteering as a student, saying hello to people at registrations. And, and then you aren't putting the pressure on yourself to network. Um, you're just saying hello. Yeah, I'd also Happy. definitely agree. With, oops, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Um, I'd also definitely agree with that one. Um, a lot of the connections I made when I started out was being the secretary of the Biology Society at Oxford. And that was like definitely a big change in terms of how I approach networking and building confidence because I just had to do it. Um, Rob, did you have a comment? I was just going to, yeah, no, I, I think I was just going to say the same thing that you just mentioned. So when I was in my PhD, I, 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 Threw my hat onto the arena. I, I nominated myself to the leadership of the ESA student section, and that was life changing. That was truly life changing because it put me in a place where I suddenly had to learn the culture of that society, and that allowed me to get to know a lot of people, as Magda said, because I had to first at the personal level, and then more at that research based level. Um, other things that I, I find as a, as a first-gen person have helped me a great deal networking. I agree with you, Rachel. I don't like that word, by the way. Uh, you can call it perhaps an informal meeting. Is doing things before, during, and after the conference, some of which uh, the other panel members have discussed. What I like to do before, now what I, what I advise my students to do before, is on the few weeks prior to the conference, usually the society will release the program. And if you have been paying attention to the papers that you read. Hopefully you've read the title. Hopefully, hopefully you've read the abstract, the introduction, methods, results, discussion, but you've also read the authorship, right? So knowing who has been doing what, as Bruno was saying, as well, is very important. You must try to culture a sense of where are the authorships knowing the names even if you haven't met them in person because then you can match make them in the program right you can look for them or are they are they actually presenting okay so their names are in the index but are they actually showing up as the first author in a long authorship list in a talk because that means most likely they are going to be at the conference right if he's somewhere in the middle or at the end that's not guaranteed but the first author usually is presented right so things that you can do then is now that you have identified who is gonna be there a couple of weeks before you go there is you can drop in an email ahead of time. This works I have found particularly with names that uh, are busy at conferences. You can send an email, say my name is such and such, I've read your papers, I'm really interested in your work, I work in this area, there's clear synergies about what you're doing, what I'm doing. I would love to take you out for a coffee. If the person that you're about to take up for a coffee, by the way, is more senior to you, ideally that person will be paying for your coffee, not all the way around. Coffee, lunch, dinner, whatever have you. Um, but I, I find that that works really well for first-gen students who don't quite understand. It's a daunting world, really, going into a conference, right? So I find that that works really well. And I also recently, I think it was Mike that mentioned, you know, after you've gone from the conference, after you've interacted with them, sending them an email so that you continue that conversation. It's It's been... It's been mainly at conferences, that interacting at conferences and preparing who am I meeting with, and then doing follow-ups at the end, after the week after I record from the conference. It's been, I, I, I think it's been purely based on that, that I've never had to interview for a, a, a position in my academic life, with the exception of the one that I currently hold. So I've never had to interview for a postdoc position. Because it was that networking, despite my first genness that I did at the conference, that you know I created links that allowed me to progress in academia. That's just been priceless, really. And it does require planning, and it, it does require 
doing your homework. You need to know no, not just what has been done in your field, but who is doing that and is that person attending. Okay, so I think I'm going to just ask one more question before we open it up to the audience. Um, and this is kind of, we've been talking a lot about talking to academics as first gen students, but one thing I've been thinking about a lot recently is talking to my own family about what I do. And it's something I'm really, really bad at. Like, how do I explain to my grandparents what a research assistant is when I got my job currently? Their first thing was, do you get paid for that? Is that a proper job? And then when I talked about one, what I wanted to do, they're like, so are you a teacher? And I was like, no, not really. Like, are you a researcher? I was like, yes, but I, you know. Um, so I just wondered how, what are people's experiences of talking to their family about being an ecologist? Is there anything that worked particularly well um, in explaining your field? Well, um, sorry. Uh, oh. Sorry. Oh. Um. You can go if you want. Uh, no, you, you can go on, sorry. That's all right. Yes, um, I'm really enjoying this conversation here, this discussion, and talking about my career with my family. It's sometimes I think it's kind of funny, or maybe I start to laugh because it's a super embarrassing situation. And I think. This is super challenging because they expect that we receive money like quickly and scientific career is super expensive and taking a lot of your time and energy and your yolf maybe actually for me that start in my career super early um and i think that the biggest challenge is because our family needs it sometimes to support myself um, for example, I, in, I'm from Brazil, and here in Brazil, and um, post-graduation students receive a scholarship, but it's not for everybody. It's like it's super uh, hard to get one. And but if you need to go to the conferences or do your research, etc., you need to find out different sources to to pay for you, even for publications. And when I was uh, submit, submitting my my manuscript of my master's, I had to pay two, $2, $2,000, $2,000. And I was like, I can't pay for it. We don't have like a, a sponsorship for this kind of payment. So um, like, it's not a, a kind of stuff that my family can understand that. How, how are you paying for your work? You were doing this and I need to pay for it. It's completely weird. I think this is more broad than it started be a first gen in ecology. And it's being like a scientist in general, but um, came from an, a low income family. This is even harder to explain them that this is, this happens. And yes, yeah, it's, it's super difficult to deal with this. Yeah, I don't think you should have to pay for your papers. That's, <laughs> that's definitely something that's very clear. Um, and I agree with. Um, you know, it is difficult to talk to your family about um, what you do. I think I have similar issues to what Josh described in, um, you know, how serious they thought that was as a career um, and how you could also sustain yourself from it. And um, I think luckily they always supported me, but I don't think it was until I got my scholarship at Oxford that they realised it would be a career. Um, so that that was kind of a turning point for me. Yeah, I think similarly to you, April, like it's not that they never supported me, like they supported me in other ways outside of, of college and stuff. And uh, they, I, I always knew I could come home and kind of, you know, tell them how my day went, but that they wouldn't fully understand. Um, my dad actually, when he found out that I was getting a PhD, he started telling his friends that I was going to be a doctor, like as in a medical doctor. And then I had people texting me saying, oh, you're doing postgraduate medicine. And I was like, no. And so he didn't understand. And then when he eventually found out what my PhD was in, that I was going to be uh, doing it at ZSL, so at the zoo, he began telling people that I was training to be a zookeeper. So it is funny, but you kind of do just have to re reiterate that and just be like, no, that's actually not what I'm doing. And it's coming from a good place. Um, but yeah, they just haven't had the same experiences as I have with with education and it's not it's not coming from a bad place it's just kind of like no this isn't actually what I'm doing 
And then similarly, sometimes when I do accomplish um, really, really significant milestones, they don't fully grasp how, you know, significant it is. And I'm like, no, that's actually a really big deal. Like I didn't win best attendance in my class like I did when I was 10. I actually did really well in my exams. So yeah, it, it is just, it, it's funny, but I also think it's important to sit down and be like, no, this is actually, this means a lot to me and I worked really hard at this and you might not fully understand it, but it is a big deal. And I do need a pat on the back sometimes. <laughs> Um, I yeah I think for sorry let me just I like for my family a lot of the it is like beyond just ecology uh, like mainly as I'm like computational and I started my master's and PhD like in the pandemic so a lot of it was just done in my room at home with my parents and I guess it's like explaining to them that I'm working when because a lot of the jobs that they're used to aren't really the they're like outside of ecology like computational jobs aren't things that they know about so the idea or like telling my grandma the other day that i was taking the train but i was still able to just work because i was taking my laptop with me and she didn't really get that uh but like like they're still quite supportive but i guess something i kind of did is i try to be more broad with what I'm explaining uh what I do in a sense that like I just and I I remember going to a like a conference about plant conservation and I kind of just stole a lot of their talking points about why it's important and I'll just say to my family that these reasons and all the like the benefits of plants is why my work is important even if I don't if I'm not working with those particular systems or and then I think if I just become more general, they they get it in that way. Yeah, um, one thing that at least in my former postdoc we were doing is, as we all have or should be practicing for our elevator talks, we also practice for our grandma talks and do it between us. It's like, okay, you have five minutes or three minutes, you have to explain what you're doing to your grandma or to a five-year-old kid, how you do it. And it's a process, I, I still suck at it, but you try to get better. Uh, my family still thinks that I'm just going somewhere, catching rats and looking what they have. What that means might be very different. For a long of that, I study high impact diseases. So diseases that if I get infected will likely kill somebody or that they have high rates of killing people. Uh, I avoid talking about, I would say just diseases, because the moment they found out that I was going and working with Lassa virus or Ebola virus or other similar, they would freak out. And then they would start calling me every five minutes, like, what are you doing and how do you protect you? I was like, Mom, I've been doing this for 10 years. I know what I'm doing. I'm still here, right? Okay, don't worry about it because they do freak out a little bit. Uh, but simplifying, as all have said, like I'm looking at diseases, I'm looking at the, the rodents and how the diseases that they pass to us are behaving in them. Simple. Don't go too many details. They still don't know when I publish a paper, it's like, oh, great, what does that mean? It's like, finish with one chapter, I have to write the other five. But uh, they've been supportive, luckily, and again, it is it is a process to explain it and to find the right words to use for different groups. Once again, I just want to touch on how important, and like, once again, we often come from families where science isn't in everyone's background. So I think, you know, I know that if my mom understands it, most everybody else will too. And, you know, and, and luckily she's open, but she slows me down. She's like, nope, I don't understand that. No, I don't understand that. Tell me again, what is an ecosystem? You know, and, and I think that that practice, once again, if there's a way to get that into a statement for graduate school or a statement for a job, if you have to practice this, if I have to convince 
my Republican uncle to support conservation issues where that's the last place his money wants to go. I know I'm half more than halfway there of trying to convince a science panel for a grant. And so use your family um, to practice, you know, it, it's frustrating. Um, and Rachel, I'm so sorry your family doesn't celebrate. Sometimes um, the week of my master's that I got my master's, my grandmas called me to congratulate me on a, winning a cupcake contest, but they did not congratulate me on my master's because it's relatable to them. them. They understand it. And so one thing, I think once again, the higher up folks in labs, PhD students, postdocs, PIs, I would really ask everyone to celebrate these accomplishments because often students don't have the families to celebrate with. And so I think as we all move through, I think it's really important to try to, um, you know, be each other's support systems in those ways that might be lacking. Um, but yeah, but also leverage your family to help your science communication and then spin that to get that next opportunity. I think it goes back to what we were talking about before about the elevator. I want to highlight that the elevator does not need to be sent necessarily down to junior people, to people who are younger, perhaps less uh, advanced in their careers. It can also be sent down to the people that you really do all your life to, your parents, your grandparents, and everybody else, right? So it's, it's an excellent exercise for outreach. Beautiful exercise to be able to explain your science in one minute to a really large audience when you're going for the, the, the job of your dreams. By the way, that's almost a requirement, right? But also by sending the elevator, I hope I'm not sounding condescending by the way, but by sending the elevator as if it were done in that way, you're really kind of like giving back to your family, to your support system, what they gave to you through, you know, putting you through school and, and whatnot, explaining the sense that you're doing. We are indebted to them indeed, right? So at the beginning of my adventures in academia, um, I studied plant and animal senescence or aging. And my parents thought that I was working in biomedicine and I was perhaps developing a cream to like get rid of wrinkles. Like it was, it was, it could not be far, farther away. I'm really not interested at all in human senescence. I'm more interested in, interested in the rest of the, of the tree of life senescence as if it were, right? So I just had to, you know, sit them down. And, and, and when I went to Spain for, for holidays, I, I took them out for, for breakfast and I, I spent a bit more time talking about what it is that I do while really trying to run away from the jargon. The challenge for me, however, at that point was that I had at that point learned the, the, the jargon, the, 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 the way of communicating science in English. So that's not something that I had actually learned in Spanish. So that, that was quite a tricky one, by the way. But I think I did okay. I, they now understand that I don't create creams, anti-wrinkle creams. <laughs> or at least I hope. <laughs> Okay, so I think now I will stop asking questions and I will let other people ask some questions. So if people want to turn on their cameras, unmute, post in the chat, um, just shout out your questions and we'll get through as many as possible. I oh, yep. Hello. Um, so thank you everyone, like that was amazing, um, that was lovely to hear. Um, I'm also a first gen ecologist, so it's great to like um, hear from both like people in like, yo like younger or like early stages of their career and also like postgraduates and researchers also being like, yeah, I can post some German, it's reassuring. Um, I had a question about, so this idea of networking and, and taking people out for coffee or, or emailing them, trying to get into their good books. Um, I always have the fear that I'm going to be a pest like am I going to annoy someone um they're very busy if they're like a an esteemed academic or researcher um showing me a way we undergraduate from nowhere is is going to be a bit of an annoyance um I guess like it's not always true but do you think it could be a possibility like how to like walk that line or should I just go for it uh, Rob Sorry, I couldn't contain my, my excitement um, about this question because I feel really strong about the fact that if, if, if by you being proactive, you're annoying somebody, you don't, work, you don't want to work with that person. So it's, it's a loss really. So if they don't reply to you or if they reply to you with a rude answer, 
they're doing you a favor by not by not having to have you work with them in that way. You move on to the next person, really. That's a really clear answer. That's a really clear red flag and walk away from that. Yeah, my current PhD supervisor. Um, so I actually had the same thing. I emailed him, I think, two years ago, um, just telling him how much I loved his work. And when I eventually come over to London, I'd love to meet him and stuff. And then he got back to me straight away. Um, it was really, really nice. And then we had a call and I said, you know, I, I, I emailed this person and this person um, and they actually didn't get back to me. And straight away he said, anybody that doesn't get back to you, you don't want to work with them because you've clearly outlined in your email that you're not you're interested in my work you haven't sent a vague email to 10 professors and it's obvious and if you said that to one or two more people um, and these were people that he worked with actually um, and he just said you, you don't want to you don't want to work with them because it's, it's not setting a nice tone for the rest of your relationship if you have to pester someone or if you have to feel like you're pestering someone so yeah I feel the exact same way as well but from the complete from the student point of view as well, which is reassuring. Thank you so much. Yep, Chris. I'm Chris. I work for the British Ecological Society in the careers um, team. But first of all, just thanks for putting on this event because it's absolutely fantastic and it's brilliant. Um, my background is also first gen going into ecology and first from my school and things like that to go and to certain universities. Um, I was wondering if the panel had experience of their feeling of identity when they come out of their education. So coming from what we may be able to describe as low opportunity, financial barriers, and so sort of a, a working class background, underprivileged, but then by going through the system and the fact that we are low income, I was able to get bursaries and, and, and a lot of things actually paid for my university education. And I came out without debt compared to my friends who, who did. Um, and so I struggle quite a lot personally with that shift from underprivileged to privileged in terms of my identity. And I wondered if the, the panel had any similar situations of how, how they sort of go through that um, and how they, they communicate that to others. So it's a very rambly niche question, but I, I love the stories from the panel so far. It's been brilliant. Um, I'll say that I kind of had a reverse of that in that I used to think that I was more middle class than I was because compared to everyone I knew like I was like one of my friends that went to university and I guess like I thought I was way more middle class and then when I went to university I met people that I was like oh I didn't realize that people did that I thought that was like a, a sort of like super like upper class thing and then it was like a, a shift for me, especially because my undergrad was in like a post 92 university where a lot of my friends were like local and were mostly first gen. And compared to them, I, I feel like the, having the different perspective has been quite helpful to, to see because I, I feel like now that I'm at Imperial, for example, there's not as many first gen and kind of working class students. and it's like the shift of going from in this group, I'm like the more kind of well-off person. And then in this group, I'm the least well-off person. Uh, it's kind of, in a way I'd say like been quite useful because I, I kind of see the same like mistake, not mistakes, but the kind of jargon or things that my friends from like the more middle-class, not first-gen background do. And then I can try and kind of account for that in myself when speaking to my friends from home or the ones who didn't go to university and kind of try to catch I would say I don't know if I can do it perfectly but try and catch myself from kind of making these assumptions and speaking in a way as if they'll immediately know what I'm talking about if that makes sense but yeah
Yeah, I've, I've gone through a, through a similar transition as the one that you mentioned as well, Chris. So I, being that I did my education up until my undergraduate inclusive in, in Spain, where uh, most universities are public and the fees are, or they used to be peanuts, really. I mean, the year that I had to, so you, the, the way in which that system works is you would pay depending on how many modules you were taking. The year that I took the most amount of modules, I had to pay 300 euro, which is nothing, right? 300 year euro a year so of course i came out of that oh and nothing to the bank and then i moved on to the us where it's i think it's quite common maybe i'm over exaggerating here but i think it's quite common that you do have to take a, a loan to go to to uni so i, I went through that reversion of i still feel like i didn't belong in there don't get me wrong okay but in talking to my colleagues they were you know they were just saying whatever little stipend we were given to pay back to the bank i i didn't have to Yeah, I had a similar kind of thing um, when I was in my undergrad. So I would have, I, I went into my undergrad through an access program. Um, and essentially in Ireland, you sit your exams and it's operated on a point system. So I would have just gotten an extra 40 points or an extra 35 points. I can't even remember because it's so insignificant now. But at the time, I remember panicking and thinking people are going to know I was given extra points. And then... I remember chatting to people in, in first year and people talking about how, how stressed they were for their exams and talking about how many points they got and stuff. And then the question came around to me, how many points did you get? And then I was kind of like, oh, well, you know, I, I came in through the hair scheme and I got given 40 points. And they were like, you got, you got given points? Why did you get given points? And, I, and why did I have to work harder than, I didn't know that was a thing. And then I was kind of like, but should I have got, I started questioning it. And I was like, should I have gotten given points? And is it fair? And then I started feeling bad. And then of course my fees were paid as well because I was after entering college through an access program. And then I think even in year two and three, when I was talking to friends about um, why they couldn't go out at the weekend because they were paying off the rest of their fees or you know their dad was paying their fees and stuff. And then I started feeling like I was in a privileged position because my fees were being paid for me. Um, and then that's what I kind of started getting almost privileged panic, if you want to call it, because I was like, I did have a little bit of an identity crisis. And I was kind of like, at the start, I didn't question it. But now I'm hearing about their financial reason. I'm feeling bad, even though it's not my fault. So, yeah, I, it's a very unique kind of situation to be in because you should not feel bad for being afforded the same opportunities as everybody else um, and being given financial help. But you do end up feeling a little bit bad. But I just think the best way to deal with that is to just kind of remind yourself that those schemes are in place for a reason and they're different to somebody else's. Uh, I think it was my opportunities were similar to Rob's, like I was at a public university. I think I was paying maybe $200 a year for my program. Obviously there were a lot of extra fees at the end, but it wasn't bad. I had a support of my family. I remember the first job I got offered, I was saying I, it was something I wanted to do. It was some research following the kind of work I wanted to do. I, didn't even ask how much my salary was going to be. I was like, I'm getting paid to do this now, so why not? I've been doing it free for two years. And went for it. When I decided to go to grad school, when they told me how much my tweet, my stipend was going to be, I was so happy. I was like, oh, I'm going to make more, so much more money that I'm making right now as a full researcher, and I'm going to be studying. This is great and then realize how expensive was living in the United States and pay, and the extra fees that many times they don't tell you until you're here. And it's like, oh, you're an international student. Here is, is an extra bill. Oh, you have this, here's an extra bill. And luckily I was under a research assistantship. So I had salary all year round on the program I was, but I have friends that were on teaching assistantships and they were paid only six or nine months of the year because on the summer you're not teaching so they had to be careful enough to save money during uh, classes period when they get were paid so they could 
keep paying rent and food and stuff during the summer, but they didn't have any income. Uh, another issue that I saw was when I decided I want to go to a PhD, I started apply, looking at universities, what programs they have, and just applying blindly. Just sending my application, paying the $25, $45 to apply. And forget it, don't think in that I needed to reach out to professors beforehand. So I got accepted to two or three universities, but one accepted me pending finding an advisor. And unfortunately, the advisor had already been, they had already uh, gotten a student, so they weren't, they couldn't get another one. Another one accepted me and was like, okay, and this is how much you have to pay each year. Maybe on the second year, you'll have a teaching assistantship. Maybe. I was like, well, where's that money coming from? I don't have that much on the bank. I don't want to get on, on debt. So I'm talking with my colleagues and friends. They were like, no, no, no. If you're going to a PhD, you have to get either a teaching assistantship or a research assistantship. Don't go for anything less. And at the end, I was lucky to find a program that had the whole system and gave me a research assistantship for five years and then moved me to teaching until I completed my program. But it's if you don't know, you don't know, and you just think that that's the norm and get, in, get a loan and then you spend so much time trying to pay for it that it's not necessary sometimes. I'm still surprised when I talk with undergrad students here how much the their loans are and how long it's gonna take them to finish paying for them. And all those things that I'm like, scares me, but hopefully eventually might change. Thanks everybody for your answers. That was really uh, nice to hear from you all, but thanks again for the event that you've put on. Um, so I just got a message from one of the organizers and apparently people can't all post on the general chat. Um, so if you could try direct messaging me and then I'll read the questions out if you don't want to turn on your cameras. I think I actually had one earlier. Um, so when we were talking about the sort of alternative experiences that first gen colleges could get for free instead of, say, the paid for volunteering um, opportunities, um, Chris was wondering whether these low cost alternatives still disadvantage first end students compared to those who could afford the flashier kind of tropical experiences or experiences abroad. Do you think there's kind of a disadvantage to doing something a bit more low cost or is it just as good? Um, I can just step in there because I, I have experience on the other end of that now in that I, I had um, a role in the Seychelles where I was able to employ um, volunteers and I think I was more inclined to to hire people that had local experience or had worked in Tesco or jobs like that um, had shown that they're willing to do stuff than necessarily than those people that had paid to do the volunteering programs so I think it can work in the other way a little bit depending on who's <laughs> hiring you Any other thoughts on that or should we move on to the next question? I think it doesn't matter. I think it's where, wherever you do it, if you do it and do it right, it's good. Uh, I, on the other hand, have a very strong opinion about those paid volunteer programs, mostly because I feel that they are abusing the students that are coming and then sometimes they don't have that a rigorous program. So then you're like, it's more a vacation than a, a research experience in some, in some of the cases I've seen it. So, but yeah, I, I don't approve of the idea that you have to pay to, to help somebody else with their projects because that's what you're doing. And it's, I, I see how these, 
these many of these centers use it to finance themselves and keep going. But I wish it wasn't necessary. Uh, I think that's why writing to professors and trying to contact them and writing grants together is the best approach. Uh, but any experience you have, it's going to be good. Yeah, just to say, I think at the end of the day, if whether you're able to say I went down to Hampstead Heath and counted seven different species of bumblebees over three weeks, or I went to Costa Rica and I watched someone do a bat survey, and it's kind of about the quality of what you're doing rather than where you're doing it, because you could get off to these exotic places and you could just end up standing there and watching work be done, or it could be raining and you mightn't get any work done. But it's kind of about what you do with your time rather than where you do it, I think. And just especially I think over lockdown, people started to get really creative with surveying and stuff and what they can actually do in their local area. And you'd be very surprised at what you're able to do and the, the kind of data that you're able to generate, I think. I think also you never really know when the experience might become useful in a way like uh, like I applied to a few PhDs before I started mine and the one I eventually took and got onto uh, some of the like code I had to use was actually mostly relevant to a thing I'd done that was not ecological at all it was like a project I did in my master's that was actually about music but I I when I was in the like interview I realized this is really similar and I could kind of spin that to say like oh I actually have done this thing but with a different system whereas I feel like at the time I wouldn't have thought it was relevant but it ended up kind of playing relevant like in the last minute yeah So I just had another question from the audience to the chat. Um, so oh, we've just had two questions. Um, okay, so one of the uh, audience is asking they're a distance learning undergrad and they just wondered if any of you found mentors outside of university in particular because they can't find mentors in their university. Um, and how you sort of get experience if you're not necessarily as connected within that atmosphere. So I, I haven't, I'm oh, sorry, Magda, go ahead. Go ahead, Rob. Uh, just very quickly, I was gonna say that I, I haven't actually found a mentor myself through that, through that channel. Um, mentors that I have found throughout my career and as a student have been more like locally based and through like more face-to-face -face interactions. However, I now act as a mentor myself. So Oxford, for instance, has got an access program and through that, with the pandemic, of course, we've not been able to do the face-to-face -face interactions that we would normally do with access students over the summer. A lot of that has been done remotely. And uh, a lot of us faculty now have got um, lasting connections with those students who came to us first as final year undergraduates. And now we are working with them in one way or the other to support them through applications to masters or PhDs or other venues of professional developments as well. I was gonna say, this is another um, area where I think different societies can be really helpful. So I don't know if, um, sorry, I don't know if the British Ecological Society has an official mentoring program, but one society I've been really involved with is the Society for Ecological Restoration. And they are trying very hard to develop a mentorship program for academics, as well as folks in industry and in practice that are practicing and working for big companies that do restoration or governments that do restoration. And um, I think that that is one avenue to just check, uh, to say like, are there mentorship programs? And even if they're not, through often they have databases of their members, like for the Eco Society for Ecological Restoration, they have a database of all their members. They have a database of the companies that sponsor them or that have business memberships. And 
people love to talk. So if you ask someone to mentor often, especially folks who, you know, are a little bit more established and aren't, um, you know, trying to get higher themselves, um, I think that people are 100% willing to help out. And to me, some of the best mentorship has come from folks who are just ahead of me in academics or in their professional um, fields. And I think that just re my mentors don't even know they're my mentors often. Um, and, you know, just acknowledging, you know, saying like, you know, like, thanks for helping me with that, or thanks for, you know, helping me read that resume that I tried to send out to someone who's just a little bit ahead of you, or who does something that you want to, someone who got the job that you wanted almost, or has the job that you hope you're qualified for in three or four or five years, often those people are willing to talk. And I know some really great connections that have started that way. Um, so once again, it's just as easy as an email, sometimes being like, you just got the job that I wanted, or you have a job that I hope I'm qualified for in a few years. Are you willing to talk? Um, and I think that often people are more than willing to chat and to help out and to, I love reading resumes. Um, I would rather, you know, read other people's statements of interest than write my own. So um, I think that's a, another great way to connect with people. Are you interviewed? No. <laughs> uh, no, I was actually just going to mention, you just reminded me there, Magda, um, before I got on my current PhD program, when I was applying last year, I went onto the website and kind of checked out last year's cohorts. And I emailed about five or six people. And I just had this spur of like, like extrovertness that I never really have, where I was just like, hey, let's set up a Teams call. Can we go over the application process? And I just ran with it met a few of them and essentially just got me to, to got them to tell me like all the tips and tricks of how they got on the PhD and sometimes it is just about asking for help and people just get an email like that like they I, I found that people that I've spoken to that are kind of in that position higher than me they just really like talking about their experience because usually they felt the same way as you at one point so, and I'm actually going out to the field tomorrow with one of the guys that helped me get on my PhD, which is just like so full circle. So he doesn't even know he's my mentor. Like, I just, it, 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 yeah, half the time they don't even know. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the the whole like a mentor doesn't know that they're like officially your mentor uh, thing, like for me there's a few people i would see on like twitter mainly uh or sometimes i mean i would sometimes like search like name of university phd application and then i'd see someone like a year before had just applied to the same like university and they just tweeted like just got in or can't believe i accepted and then i'd message them and say oh like and then often like even if i don't ask they'll offer to help me like they'll say oh I can take a look at your CV or I can see your statement and then another place that I found is like for more like uh maybe not like CVs but like on like Reddit sometimes I'll find a question that someone posted a year ago or so where they have had an issue or they're like I want to move this this university or like here's some code I don't understand and then I'll message them being like, oh, did anyone get to you? Did it, did you figure this out? And then by that time, they, they'll have had a solution. And then even for myself now, someone, because I remember posting, asking about uh, PhDs on Reddit, like maybe like two years ago. And I just had someone like two years later, a few months ago, actually message me saying, oh, they saw my post a few years ago and they were asking about it. So and I obviously was quite willing to give them any tips I had. And I was just actually quite happy that someone managed to stumble upon that thread and reach out. Um, so Chris, who just spoke earlier from the BES, has just messaged and said that the BES careers team are launching a new mentoring program this year. Um, and first gen is likely to be like a sort of option to highlight if you want support. Um, so that could be worth keeping an eye out for. Um, so are there, we've got uh, seven minutes left. So if there are any more questions that people want answered, 
um, just send them across or turn on your camera and your mic um, and just go for it. Uh, Alicia. Hi, um, I'm doing A-levels at the minute and I think with A-levels comes academic challenge like um, university does. Uh, and I find that a lot of my family have been through apprenticeships and they don't really know how to give um, advice and support on that. So I was wondering as first generation students, how you were able to overcome that academic challenge without the support of having family that had gone through it themselves. Um, I'll say for me, uh, what I did a lot, I feel like a lot of my answers involve like the internet, but, uh, I watched a lot of like YouTube channels where people would explain certain things. And then I think just, I kind of had like a, so there's like podcasts I'd listen to and seeing like other students, they were kind of like my support network if I didn't have people that were trying to do the same thing so try and see what other people had done and sometimes there'd be these like uh especially like for a level I feel like there's a lot of content where someone would explain it uh for me and then try and kind of use that yeah um yeah so social media for me <laughs> Yeah, I remember um, things like doing UCAS forms and stuff were maybe more challenging because you kind of felt like you were on your own a bit. And um, even things like writing CVs, if you don't have anyone to kind of look over it for you and things, um, especially when you're transitioning from that A-level phase into what, what comes next, I think that is um, quite daunting and maybe... Well, there should be support networks within um, within your college, hopefully. But if you can reach out to friends who maybe do have more of a support system, that could be one way of, of getting that extra support. Um, but yeah, as I said, uh, feel free to contact any of us on the panel as well, because we'd be more than happy to um, give you any help that we can. Yeah, I guess when I was doing my equivalent to A level, um, I kind of just so I live with my mom, my sister, and uh, my sister was younger than me, and I remember trying to study at home and then trying to study at the library and not really knowing where where to study and where under pressure and stuff. And I kind of spoke to my mom and said, uh, from this hour to this hour, just leave me in my room. Don't come in. Like, I know you're going to come in and try help and give tea and coffee and everything. But I, I kind of just telling her what, where, when I work best and stuff and when I want to be left alone almost. Um, and then figuring out what, when I wanted to go to the library. Um, and yeah, like just kind of kind of letting them know that I'm actually under a lot of pressure right now. This is how I'm feeling. Um, so I'd, I'd really appreciate it if, you know, you could you could leave me for a bit or else. Um, it, when I when I felt like talking, I'd come down and I'd say, right, I, I want to watch a film now or I, I'm feeling a bit better now. And just kind of, yeah, let, letting them know what's going on because obviously we're all in a similar position where even when I went into my undergrad, like my mom would have never studied for exams before. So she couldn't really get her head around the fact that I was in the library until 10 o'clock. And I was kind of just like, look, don't worry. Um, if I need you to come and get me, you can come and get me. And just, yeah, kind of open dialogue, I guess, um, to let them know how you're feeling. But if you are feeling under pressure, just make sure you, you talk to people, don't let it build up. Oh, Emmanuel. Yeah, uh, hello. Yeah, so I'm Emmanuel. I'm from Nigeria. Thank you for the good things you guys are doing. I really appreciate, it. and I've learned a lot from here. So, um, my question is, um, I'm also a first gen, actually, one of eleven children, and the first to actually go through a master's degree. But then, um. 
we have like a situation in my country where you have people like for me, I've done the master's degree, I've completed past my courses, but I don't have a degree because of some challenges with my institution, because my institution doesn't award the degree, but my the university, the institution is affiliated to award the degree, but then they are on, they are on strike and this could go on for a while and then you don't get your degree for maybe a couple of years. And then you want to apply for a PhD position, but then you don't have an evidence to show that you have actually gone through this. I don't know if you guys have any advice on that. Well, to start, depending where you're going, if you're coming to the States, you don't need a master's degree to apply for a PhD. So at least that's here. I'm pretty sure you can also talk to your advice to the professors you're contacting to apply for the programs and they can help you out on the process. And if you can show like, hey, this is the classes I took, the university is closed, I cannot get the papers, but uh, there might be a way to, to waive it or help you out. I would say reach out to uh, not necessarily the administrative, but the professor you're gonna, you're thinking of working with as they might be able to, if they really, if, if they, you have a trust with them and they know you and they, they see the work and they're like, okay, no, that, yeah, we will find a way to, to make this easy for you. Like there, there are always ways around. You just need to communicate with them and ask. Rob, thanks. Thank you. Hi, Emmanuel. Nice to meet you. That's that's a really tough situation that you're in, it sounds, I think. And I want to second what Bruno is saying. It just goes on to, to show really the value of building a relationship with your um, your dream advisor, really. So one doesn't really build a relationship online through email um, a couple of days before the deadline is due for a PhD application, right? It takes it takes weeks. It, well, actually, I'd say it takes months, right? So, for instance, in the US, typically, application deadlines, and also here in the UK, it's around like you know late December, January. So, I think it's wise to start perusing who would you like to work with. I'd say minimum four months before that deadline. Sometimes six months. I'm not saying that you have to send an email and have a back and forth every week. Sometimes the communications go by, you, you know, you, you introduce yourself, you say how excited you are about that person's work. You, you have to be very specific in why you want to work, work with that person. Once you've built that report, you can explain your situation. Once there's a buy-in from the recipient, you can explain that situation. And um, that really can make a huge difference, by the way. Uh, when I took my, so in the US, when you do your, your PhD, or at least back in the day, when I did my PhD, I had to take my, my uh, a general records examination, I think it's called like GREs. And I didn't do very well in the, in the, in the oral parts, particularly did okay in the quantitative, but not very well in the oral part. Shocker, I'm, I'm not, I'm not made to speak, right? Um, so, you know, I was quite intimidated by that. I, 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 I had an opportunity to, to flag that to my prospective advisor, right? And, and she told me, you know, don't worry about it. That's not the thing that we're going to be assessing you for so long as you can communicate in English. The, the topic that I'm telling you is quite different from your current situation, but I'm just saying, if you feel comfortable to share that situation as you just did with us, with that person, that can go a very long, very far away. Thank you. Okay, so unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap up now. But um, before we do, I'd just like to thank everyone for coming and contributing to such a great discussion. I certainly had lots of questions left over. So it was really nice to see that we got into a lot of detail about things. Um, I'd like to say a big thank you to the panelists for volunteering and the British uh, Ecological Society Conservation Special Interest Group for helping me with organising the panel. Um, if you have any thoughts or feedback on tonight, then please feel free to get in touch. You can either get in touch through the BES conservation email. You can message me on Twitter. Um, I can also answer any other questions that you have left over. Uh, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your evening. And thanks for joining us. And thank you, Josh.
Thanks very much, Josh. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank Thanks, Josh. Well done.